Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this second episode, we will talk with Margarita Seni about the state of museum education in Europe today, the most important difficulties and opportunities highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, how museum educators are facing distant and blended learning today, and the future of the sector. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. In the last few years, along with the digital transformation of cultural heritage, the view of museums has become more open, international and ubiquitous in the ways of connecting with visitors and solving all their contents. In this new concept of museum, heritage education has also been adopted. A great number of big and medium-sized institutions have created digital heritage contents in virtual galleries or exhibitions for educational purposes. Some of them have launched educational platforms and games, and others have been very active in social media and other third-party platforms. At this point, the big issue is little museums where economic difficulties neither allow them to develop digital initiatives nor to increase education staff numbers sufficiently. This situation is also reflected in formal education, where according to the Eurydice report, in 2019, the EU countries offered little or not guidance and proper training to the educators. But it's not all bad news. According to the NEMO survey on the impact of the COVID-19 situation on museums in Europe, published in May 2020, a great part of museums have increased their online visit and both educational and collection-related materials, including video and film contents, were most popular with online audiences. Also, there were individual initiatives born at this time from different museums' education departments. Taking this background, let me propose some questions. Do the educational programs in museums work in the correct way facing this situation? Are they innovative enough? How is the future for museum education? This week, I would like to talk with Margarita Sani about it. Hello, Margarita. Thank you very much for being here in this second episode. Thank you, Raul, for inviting me. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Margarita Sani holds a degree in Literature and Philosophy, University of Bologna, and a Master of Arts in Museums and Galleries Administration, City University of London. Since 1985, she has been working at the Institutes of Cultural Heritage of the region Emilia Romagna, where she is in charge of international projects, in particular on museum education, lifelong learning, and intercultural dialogue. In the last 20 years, she has designed and managed several key funded projects, in particular on museum education, lifelong learning, and intercultural dialogue, some of which have been identified as best practice by the EU Commission. She is an active member of many professional museum associations and networks, among which NEMO, ICOM, European Museum Academy. She is an adjunct professor at the Department of Arts, University of Bologna, a member of the steering committee of European Education and coordinator of the Learning Museum Group in NEMO, network of European museum organizations, where she has been a member of the executive board until 2019. As we can see, it's a difficult moment for museums all over the world due to COVID-19 and also for the museum education sector. From your position as coordinator of the LEM group in NEMO, how do you see the state of museum education in Europe today? I think that museum educators, apart from COVID, are the professions or the professionals in the museum sector that have been exposed to the biggest changes in the last decades. They have been exposed to really stress tests. The COVID-19 is one of many, uh, but in general, I think they've had to, to really meet uh, lots of challenges, starting from uh, an increase 
increasingly diversified audience, whereas in, say, 20 years ago, the, the most important audience of museums and the most import, the important target groups of museum educators were school children. Increasingly, uh, there have been other uh, segments, other audiences that museums have to cater for, adults, and in general, uh, they have to uh, develop new programs uh, to both to re uh, respond to the um, to the requests coming from the public and also from the funders. So museum educators have had to develop um, intercultural uh, programs, programs on intercultural learning, programs to uh, contribute to social inclusion and meet. So as I said, both the expectations of the audience and of the funders. And that has widened the scope of intervention of museum educators enormously. We also talk nowadays of audience development. Uh, who does that if not museum educators? It seems like many of these new tasks that museums have taken upon themselves increasingly uh, widening their, their uh, action as, as a social responsible organization, it seems like these tasks have been uh, charged to um, or, or entrusted to museum educators. Again, lifelong learning, audience development, intercultural dialogue, all of this has, in, in my opinion, uh, moved or shifted the focus from education as such uh, or learning to public engagement. The definition of learning itself uh, which uh, does not only refer to the acquisition of facts and figures, but to the development of individuals in their personal uh, life and in their professional life. All of this as enormously the work of, of museum educators. So the, I, I see this, uh, the question was the state of museum education in Europe today, apart from COVID, which has added an extra element, uh, I think this is a profession that has really come uh, a long, long way and has changed itself enormously in the recent years. It's great to see the museum education domain developing itself in different ways, Margarita. It's a moment where museums are turning to digital and educational activities in museums are diversified too. It's important to engage with all types of audiences and include new ways of understanding the cultural heritage today. Yes, and I didn't mention participation because participatory practices also add an extra challenge because if you have to be a facilitator, uh, you really have to develop extra skills. So the skills that a museum educator needs are very uh, varied at the moment, touching from social to mediating to negotiation to communication. So this is the big challenge at the moment. Well, to evaluate this aspect, some organizations such as NEMO, ICOM or the European Foundation have conducted surveys and virtual sessions with educators working with digital cultural heritage to know their needs. Could you tell our audience some of the most important difficulties and opportunities highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic for the sector in the NEMO study case? Uh, NEMO researched the sector a month or so after the, the first lockdown, so in, uh, in March, April, uh, Nemo sent out a questionnaire to all museums. Actually, the focus was not only on museum educations, of course, but uh, on the whole uh, state uh, of play of, of European museums. And it was indeed COVID has acted as a magnifying glass uh, on the role and on the structure, on the functioning of museums. And uh, the main outcomes of, of course, of the research were, uh, as it is, uh, as you can imagine, a drop of visitors, um, losses in income, uh, both from the reduction of tickets, but also from the discontinuing of programs and projects. And of course, and this really has to, to, to do with the, uh, the educators, the development uh, of digital services. So from the research, even from the early research of NEMO, uh, it turned out that 93% uh, of museums of the, of the respondents uh, declared that they had increased or started 
started online services during the pandemic, 75% had increased or started social media activities, and especially Facebook, and 53% that they uh, had created, sometimes for the first time, video content. And I think here we, we, we face one difficulty because uh, many of these uh, museum professionals were not ready to uh, move to the digital, to do that shift, to produce video content, for instance. It requires some skills. So a lot of the, uh, of the materials that, that were produced during the, the lockdown, during the COVID months, the, the hardest uh, COVID months, were not very good quality. Uh, but in, in any case, there was a lot of production. And, and I think it is also interesting to see that uh, only 7% of the respondents reported that they had hired new staff to do these, to do these new tasks. And indeed, 40% uh, said that they had changed the staff tasks. So this big challenge uh, with regard to the professional skills uh, was there from the very beginning. Uh, eight out of 10 uh, respondents suggested that they required additional support for the digital transition. Indeed, uh, the, 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 um, the research was uh, repeated uh, recently. So now on the NEMO website, there is a, um, a, a consolidated report, including both the March report and the most recent one. But basically what stands out um, uh, is that um, Indeed, it is uh, very necessary uh, when, when talking about the digital for museums to embrace this shift, this change. And, uh, and this is also where the um, Europeana and NEMO research uh, came about in May uh, to um, assess uh, how willing museum educators are to use digital content, which is already there such as that provided by Europeana. So the, the, the issue of training, skilling, upskilling and reskilling uh, prof museum professionals is there. It is very needed to uh, this continuous professional development of, of museum educators, especially with regard to the uh, management of digital tools, to the production of uh, educational activities in remote using the digital. And indeed, some of the European projects have uh, already looked into this, uh, such as the Musa project, which, which developed four uh, professional profiles uh, having to do with the digital. And now also recently, I was told that the Biblio uh, European funded project, which is developing uh, two new uh, professions uh, for the libraries, but I think very significant also for the museum world. Uh, one is called the Digital Transformation Facilitator, and the other one is called the Community Engagement and Communication Officer. So all in all, the pandemic showed that it is very, very needed and crucial to invest in the digital and to invest in the upskilling of museum professionals in this area. That's true. The digital transformation has started very quickly through the last few years and the lack of skills in museum educators and museum staff is a reality these days. For this reason, I believe these European projects are really good to help staff reskilling and upskilling themselves, developing new positions needed, but also to get the correct tools to take museums to the next level. Another thing I think they need is not to be locally focused, but also to think big. Getting this view, they could be attractive for a wider audience, get more income, more visits, and be more innovative. Now, there are lots of case studies, models, and projects to follow on where a sector could learn a lot. Yes, and I think also for small museums, of course, the museums that encounter the, the most difficulties were the small and medium-sized one. And I think that pooling resources is always essential. Uh, sharing maybe professional support uh, or uh, putting together you know, different initiatives or different contents uh, again, uh, working together is all, and networking is always uh, always a good solution. Yeah, the Learning Museum Group of NEMO is a good example of it, and it shows how networking helps museum educators to improve their skills. There are lots of samples from museums all over the world with digital education tools and programs. 
could you tell the audience how European museum educators are facing distance learning and blended learning today? Yes, well, how are they facing uh, distance learning and blending learning today? Well, I think that they are uh, facing it uh, or, or facing the situation with creativity, with commitment, uh, a lot of commitment. And uh, what they have done um, to actually um, produce uh, educational content and continue um, educational activities uh, in this very difficult time, because also um, well, in my country, in Italy at the moment, for instance, museums open and closed. Uh, they might be open for two weeks and then depending on the situation in the area where they are located, they close again. And so really it is very unpredictable and it's very difficult for, for museum professionals and museum educators to work in this situation. So they are reacting with creativity, with commitment. They, they have used and they're using what they already had, if they had it, for instance, and I'm referring to um, Google Art, virtual tours of the museum. I've seen, for instance, some museums developing activities. Um, so not, on, not only um, offering the, the typical guided tour via uh, the virtual tour, but also organizing activities like treasure hunts uh, in the virtual context, in the virtual, um, say, museum as such. Um, and, and of course, uh, but this in the case of a, of a virtual tour, which was already there, because that's, that of course takes a long time to, to be done. Um, or they develop new content, uh, again, with, with lack of, of basic skills, maybe, of how to do it. There have been lots of uh, um, virtual uh, or guided tours in remote meetings with maybe experts, with the scientists, with the art historian, and so on. Um, there has been um, an enhanced use of storytelling, for instance, because uh, story and that is that's been um, used uh, storytelling not only in remote but also in person. So when museums reopened and then say children or visitors uh, could go to the museum, but for instance in the case of children, educational activities with with materials could not be would have restrictions, right? Because you cannot touch, you cannot. Uh, use the same um, um, kits for, for the educational activities and so on. Uh, so storytelling has been used a lot and, and proved to be very effective. Of course, uh, workshops have been offered to be used in remote and in some cases in a blended uh, modality. So for instance, some museums have developed materials that could be taken out to schools, for instance, uh, and, and then the uh, educational activity would take place in remote, uh, but and connecting the museum educator being based at the museum with the audience, uh, doing the, the, the practical activity with the material provided by the museum in their own context. So in, in the school or sometimes even at home. Um, in, in this case, um, museums have proved to be very, very precious also for families uh, when homeschooling became the norm, especially uh, at the very beginning of the, lock the lockdown. And so they provided um, educational or sometimes just creative materials also for parents to support the children in their learning. And I have an example also, this is a museum in my own city, which is Reggio Emilia, museum which had um, large spaces um, that were no longer used or can no longer be used as they used to uh, for uh, school groups. And uh, they are hosting a school or some classes of a school. Um, schools in order to uh, distance children, uh, looked for uh, different venues. Uh, and in this case, the museum offered itself to, to, and this is proving to be very, very interesting because uh, the museum is working together with the school, which is uh, hosted, uh, which is like in residence, so to say, in the museum, they are developing together and testing together materials that will then later be used for other schools when finally, eventually, at some point, 
museums will reopen and we will go back to normal life. This project sounds really exciting. The museum needs to go out from the building to teach learning the values of cultural heritage. Also, it's really important that museum educators work together with teachers too, and it's a model of teaching they need to develop more often. Well, we have talked about the present in all this talk, what about the future? This question must be asked. How do you see the future of museum education after COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, well, I cannot think of the future of museum educators or of museum education uh, if not in conjunction with the future of museums in general. Uh, because I think that this uh, pandemic has changed our society to such an extent that it will leave definitely some traces behind in the way in which we relate to people in, in the way in which we work together. And, and some of the tools that we have been using and that turned out to be essential for us to, to remain connected, I don't think that we will let them go ever. They will remain and we will uh, make the best use of them. So I think that definitely uh, the future of museum education is going to be a hybrid, blended uh, model of museum education. But I must also say that museum educators have suffered very much from this uh, situation because uh, many museums uh, outsource their educational services. So the museum educators are not employed by the museum, are not permanently employed by the museum. And so they were the ones who suffered most in having, in, in, in some cases, being laid off or going on furlough or having a, a reduced time, uh, working time. So the guides, for instance, we didn't mention in this conversation the guides. So those uh, professionals, those people who take the visit around in a museum. They're not museum educators as such, but they are an important element, important figures to uh, disseminate and to make the, the heritage and the collections uh, accessible and, and meaningful and to contribute to their interpretation. Of course, they have suffered very much from the lack of tourism and the reduction of, of physical visits. Well, in some cases, say, I found this very interesting that some museums have used the, the time to offer offer uh, training online for the museum guides, for these external people who work in museums but are not employed by the museums. And likewise, something that I didn't mention before, also museums offer training uh, to teachers. They use the time to, to connect to teachers and to, uh, and to train them to, to use the resources of, of the museum and to inform them about what the collections are and what kind of, say, of content they can provide. I think in general, how I see the future of museums and the future of uh, museum educators in the short term or in the medium term, let's say, uh, museums and museum educators will have to focus, focus on their local audiences because inevitably, uh, with all the restrictions for travel, um, the, the local audiences is really an asset and, and something to, to concentrate on. And in the uh, long-term future, I, I think that uh, when everything is back to normal, I think that a blended uh, model is the one that will in the end succeed. So using, making the most of the digital resources that we have experienced and that we have developed and uh, um, as a way to, to connecting to, to the audience and, uh, and at the same time keeping, of course, what is so important for a museum, which is the objects and the authenticity that is found within the walls of the museum. I think museum educators must be employed full time. Nowadays, with blended learning, it's more important than ever to have education professionals working physically as before and digitally as now is required. A museum educator should create digital educational content with teachers and creatives and not to separate the digital skills from the museum education professional. Yes, definitely. Yes, uh, that is the ideal situation. Um, of course, you know, the, the question now is also all these online activities that people take part in are for free. So is that a profitable model? I mean, the museums, as I said, uh, when, when mentioning the, the, the NEMO research, uh, lost uh, in terms of 
uh, income not only for the tickets for the admissions that we are uh, lacking, but also because uh, they would not um, could not sell, so to say, uh, maybe their educational workshops or, or these things. So there is also um, uh, there are also some museums that are developing online activities, not for free, but uh, against payment for certain categories of people. Uh, uh, for instance, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, we're talking about a big museum. They developed um, paid workshops uh, for uh, vocational education and training students um, with a designer. So these, these students, technical students, would have the possibility of working online in remote with a designer so maybe you know there are also uh, creative new ways of imagining how to raise some money and develop some income uh, even in remote to end this talk could you give a tip or a recommendation to our audience about what they can explore in the educational environment to engage better in the distant learning experience well the the uh, only tip or recommendation that I could give is something that, again, comes from a museum, the, the Rijksmuseum. We, we organized um, in uh, July, last July, we organized a webinar uh, with uh, two museum educators from the Rijksmuseum uh, for the members of the uh, working group LEM of NEMO. And they presented what they had uh, done during this, uh, say, uh, shift, how they had reinvented themselves and their educational activities uh, during lockdown. And uh, the main point they made is that even in remote, they always started, uh, they always start from the need of the, of the audience in the past. They did always to develop educational activities and they continued to do that. Uh, in remote. So very important, um, it's very important to uh, develop uh, and, and, and to nurture these uh, focus groups, uh, develop a, a community, say, develop a, a relationship with the audience. So the, the, the tip I would give uh, would be this, to, to, to have these um, these contacts, these uh, stable, permanent contacts with the audience to create these channels. And they can also be created, uh, sometimes they can even work better uh, in remote because uh, people don't need to, to go to a physical meeting, they can simply connect from home. So to explore and to take into account the needs of the audience. Say that the takeaway from that webinar for me was start always from the needs of your audience and try to look into those needs um, by sending out questionnaires by opening a, a page on the uh, on your website by inviting your your visitors or not necessarily your visitor your community to express their needs and take them into account when developing your your educational offer thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and share your view around this domain thank you it was a pleasure if you could like to learn more about mission education and its pedagogies i recommend you this week a book published in rodlich titled museums and education purpose pedagogy performance written by Elaine Hooper Greenhill in 2007. To take an approach around lifelong learning and inclusion and accessibility in museum education, the book published in ETSI, titled Lifelong Learning in Museums, a European Handbook, edited by Gifts and Gifts, Margarita Sani, Jane Thompson, in 2007, is a really good option. There are many recommendations that can be applied in digital environment. If you want to know European projects working on museum education, I suggest you explore and test the prototypes from the Mono Project website. In this Erasmus Plus project, researchers are developing tools for engaging with young audiences through augmented reality apps, games, and virtual tours. Another powerful project is the CRIMA or Creative Making for Lifelong Learning project. The project aims to learn how to make better use of museum collections for creative making in a connective and accessible way and deliver new skills and competencies to help adults to stay creative through their lifetime. Thank you very much for being today with Margarita Sani and me in this podcast. 
Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Final sources from this topic we talk about in this podcast on the D8 Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iVox or any platform you listen to and follow the project on social media. See you next week.